let's uh, take our Bibles, if we could, and open them to the book of uh, First Californians. I'm sorry, First uh, First Corinthians. First Corinthians, chapter six, verses nine through eleven. And uh, this is kind of an awkward session for the opening one. Uh, usually you want to have someone give something uplifting, <laughs> kind of a warm fuzzy for the day kind of thing. Uh, but this session is kind of uh, heavy. It's a difficult topic. It's something that most of us would rather not think about. A lot of us don't think something like this could ever happen in the United States of America. But the title of this session is The Coming Collision, uh, The Pulpit uh, Versus Government Encroachment. And uh, if you've watched the news at all, you might be familiar with this uh, lady here. Her name is Kim Davis. She was, if I have the story straight, uh, she made national news. She is the, uh, or was, the elected into the position of clerk in one of the counties in Kentucky, if I, if I have that right. And as I understand her testimony, she is about four or five years old in the Lord. So she's a very new Christian. And uh, she found herself in the crosshairs between the government and her beliefs in the Bible. And she decided that she did not want to, as position, uh, as the clerk, issue licenses to same-sex couples. She didn't want her name on those certificates because she felt that this conflicted with her biblical beliefs. If she had done this, let's say, in early June, it wouldn't have been a problem. But now, all of a sudden, it becomes a problem because of a recent Supreme Court case that was handed down in later June. Uh, called Obergefell versus Hodges. It was a very narrowly decided case. There's nine justices on the Supreme Court. It was a five to four case um, or vote. And those justices created out of thin air uh, something that's really not found in the Constitution. I call it an allegorical reading of the Constitution. Uh, they created a constitutional right uh, for a same-sex marriage. So here's Kim Davis running uh, afoul of a federal Supreme Court decision, and she had to make a choice. Is she going to obey the scripture and her understanding of it and her conscience, or is she going to obey the government? And she decided to obey the Bible. And this uh, made national news. As you saw this story unfold, she actually spent some time in jail uh, her job, you know, became in jeopardy. And people say, well, why doesn't she just leave and go to another job? Well, the problem is she was elected into that position. The people put her there. So this is the kind of thing that's starting to happen all across the country. And the reason I bring her situation up is I kind of look at it as a paradigm for the things that are rapidly coming upon the evangelical church. And I, when I watched this unfold, I just had so many exploding thoughts. Um, and my thoughts were going every which way. <clears throat> so just as an organizing device, uh, what I've decided to do is organize this presentation into five myths. Uh, because of this kind of situation happening, there are five myths that are being disseminated into our culture, most of which directly some indirectly affect your role as a shepherd over a flock. So let's kind of go through these myths and let's see if we can uh, shed some light on a difficult topic. Here are the five myths. And here is myth number one. Myth number one is same-sex individuals and couples should be given the exact same legal protections um, afforded to racial minorities. So what the culture is being told over and over again is that just as we got over racism, because as you know, there was a time 
in this country where blacks, for example, were not given civil rights protection. There was a time in this country when um, if a black and a white got married, that violated the law. And fortunately, our country got over that, and we erased those racial stereotypes and laws. But the thinking is, just as we got over that issue, we need to get over this homosexual issue. We need to get over what they call homophobia. And so we need to get rid of any law that would bar a same-sex couple from marrying, and we need to afford same-sex individuals civil rights status. And if we don't, then we're just like those racists of the past who clung to those old laws from the Jim Crow South. And so the argument that's being made is same-sex individuals deserve the exact same legal protection and the exact same right to marry as you find in, uh, uh, with racial minorities. And I believe that that is a myth. Um, let me explain to you why that is true. Historically, when our country has granted civil rights status to individuals, four criteria had to be met. Number one, sizability. Number two, immutability. Number three, an obvious pattern of discrimination against a group because of some unchangeable characteristic about themselves. And number four, you're the, uh, what you're granting people civil rights status for is something that is innocuous or harmless. And I believe that homosexuals and same-sex individuals, despite their propaganda that they wage against us constantly, don't meet any of these criteria. So let me kind of go through these one by one. The first is sizability. Is the uh, same-sex population a sizable population? Most of the statistics from this come from a study done by Alfred Kinsey called the Kinsey Study. And it's from that study that we've had trumpeted over and over again to us, the idea that 10% of the American population is homosexual. In fact, we've heard that so frequently, most of us believe it's true, because if you repeat a lie frequently enough, people eventually will believe it, right? This Kinsey study, what you have to understand about it, is it was put together through uh, population samples which had a disproportionately high number of homosexuals. It was put together in prisons, for example, that was their population set, in bars, in gay bars and things of that nature, and that's how they got this number 10%. The fact of the matter is the Kinsey study has been radically uh, discredited. Every subsequent study that has come out has shown that the number is far less than 10%. It's more like 1 to 2 to 3% uh, at most. The second piece of criterion which was used when we got around to the business of civil rights around 1964 was the criterion of immutability. And what that means is you possess some sort of characteristic about yourself that you cannot change. Obviously, uh, African Americans easily fit that category, as do Hispanics, Asians, Caucasians, because you cannot control your skin color. In fact, how many ex-blacks do you know? Um, Michael Jackson might be <laughs> one exception, but you, you, you don't have ex-blacks. You don't have ex-Asians. You don't have ex-Hispanics. You don't have ex-Caucasians, but the fact of the matter is you do have ex-homosexuals. Uh, here's a study from uh, Dr. Robert Spitzer, the renowned gay activist psychiatrist who in 1973 successfully managed to have homosexuality removed from the American Psychiatric Association's list of mental disorders. He's published his results in a new study which shows homosexual orientation can be changed. 
According to Dr. Spitzer's findings, which were eventually published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior, 200 homosexuals changed their lifestyles as a response to therapy during the five-year duration of the study. That kind of uh, adds credibility in my mind, because that's exactly what the Bible says, doesn't it? Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, such as some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. There's our word, homosexuals. It's the Greek word, arsenokoitis. And you'll notice that according to the scripture, homosexuality is lumped in just with, with any other sin. Being a homosexual is no different than being a fornicator, an idolater, an adulterer. A thief, someone who's covetous, or a drunkard, or a reviler, or a swindler. Now people like to say, well, Andy, don't you know that homosexuals are born with that disposition? Well, so are fornicators. So are adulterers. So are thieves. You know, I was born into the world with a desire to, as a heterosexual, to have sex with every attractive woman that I saw. That doesn't make it right. I was born that way, and fortunately, under the Spirit's control, heterosexual lust, you know, can be curbed and controlled. And so, this is the biblical position on homosexuality, and you'll notice at the bottom there, Paul says, such as some of you were. Under the influence of the Spirit, you can change. So this idea that homosexuality is some sort of immutable characteristic on equal par with race or skin color, to my mind, is an apples and oranges comparison. The third piece of criterion that went into the civil rights movement is not only do you have to demonstrate immutability, but you have to demonstrate there's there's been a pattern of discrimination against you based on your immutable characteristic. So, uh, for example, it's easy for blacks, African Americans, to show this. They can point to the residuals of slavery. They can point to the Jim Crow South. And the fact of the matter is, the homosexual community cannot point to a pattern of discrimination against them because of their, quote, sexual orientation, close quote. According to one, uh, actually, let me back up for a second, read something out of USA Today. Now, USA Today is not exactly what we would call a member of the right-wing conspiracy by any stretch of the imagination. But according to USA Today, homosexual couples who live together may be wealthier than heterosexual live-in couples. An analysis of new census numbers suggests that gay male couples appear to be particularly affluent out-earning even married couples. Gay couples had an income of around $60,000 a year in household income. Married couples, $47,000 a year. Homosexual couples, $37,000 a year. Now some of these uh, numbers uh, might be adjusted a little bit with inflation, but you get the idea. This idea that there's some sort of pattern of discrimination against homosexuals in America leading to economic deprivation, uh, the, the, the case simply cannot be made. And the fourth piece of criterion that was examined is innocuousness. Take a look at, uh, just for a minute, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 13. Actually, let me rephrase that. Keep your finger in Deuteronomy 10, verse 13, and open up to Romans 1, verses 18 and following. Is homosexuality innocuous? Innocuous simply means harmless. Obviously, one's skin color is harmless. It doesn't hurt anybody. But what does the scripture say about homosexuality? Paul writes, For the wrath of God 
is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. By the way, that's why the Greek word arsenokoitis is used. From the word arsenokoitis, we get the word arsonist. And so that fits this description of homosexuality in terms of burning with the fires of lust, lust out of control, fire out of control, where we get the word arson. It, just, it explains why this particular word is used when we look at some of the English words derived from arsenocoitus. But they abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. If you really want to know where homosexuality comes from, you have to take a look at Romans 1. Romans 1 very clearly says that God has revealed himself from heaven in what we call general creation. It's no front page news that God exists. God has disclosed himself in the scripture for sure, but he has also disclosed himself in creation. And what do people do with that knowledge? They take the knowledge of God as revealed in creation and they make a decision to hold it down and to suppress it and to explain it away with fairy tales like the book, like uh, the theory of evolution and so forth. And, and consequently, when you're out of relationship with God, you have no understanding of the relationships that God has established. Later on in that chapter, it says one of the relationships that gets out of control is parent and child. You have children in rebellion against parents. That's all connected to taking how God has revealed himself and suppressing it. Because if you don't know God and you don't care about what God thinks, you don't have any basis for understanding the parent-child relationship since God is the author of that relationship. In the same way, God is the author of sexuality. The sex drive is a gift from him. And he has given us standards or principles by which that gift is to be expressed within. But you see, if I suppress the true knowledge of God as revealed in creation, then the marital relationship, which God is the author of, becomes confused. And so that, in essence, is where arsenocoitus or homosexuality comes from. It, it, there's a confusion of sexual identity because people are out of a relationship with the God that made him and are suppressing his truth. And so what happens is they receive in their own persons the due penalty of their error. According to one study, up to 55% of homosexual men with anorectal complaints have gonorrhea. 80% of patients with syphilis are homosexuals. Chlamydia is found in 15% of asymptomatic homosexual men, and up to one-third of homosexuals have an active anorectal herpes simplex virus. In addition, a host of parasites, bacterial and viral and protozoan are all rampant in the homosexual population. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10 and verse 13, explains why God put national Israel under the Old Testament law. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 13 says, And keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am giving you today for your own good. So whether we're in the prior dispensation or the present dispensation, why does the Creator give us principles and rules to follow? Largely to protect us. And if I decide in my sexuality to just run roughshod over the principles of God, then I will begin to suffer consequences in my own physical body. For example, I might wake up one day and say, you know, stop lights and stop signs and red lights, they really annoy me. They are an encumbrance upon my freedom 
and my autonomy and my choice. So today I'm just going to drive. Th I'm just going to drive around as if stop lines, stop lights, and stop signs don't exist. Well, we know how that story is going to end. You're going to hit someone, kill someone, or you could be hit and killed yourself. And see, the homosexual agenda and movement and population just acts as if God has never spoken on this subject, and they want to run roughshod over what God has established. And they're astonished when they receive, in their own physical bodies, consequences. So is this fourth piece of... Uh, this fourth criterion, is that satisfied? Is homosexuality innocuous and as harmless as skin color? I would say it is not. See, every, every way you look at it, the homosexual movement simply does not fit the criteria given to those afforded civil rights protection in America. It's not a sizable population. They don't have an immutable characteristic. There's no pattern of discrimination against them. And their characteristic that they want legal protection over is not innocuous or harmless at all. Well, if all of this is true, then why is there such a push today to sort of allow the homosexual movement to piggyback on the civil rights movement? The answer, I believe, was given in 1987 in a very telling article in Guide, uh, which is a homosexual uh, publication, the authors are Mar Marshall Kirk and Erastus Pill, and they essentially laid out what many consider to be a blueprint, all the way back in 1987, a blueprint for overhauling what they call straight America. Here's how we get America to capitulate to the same-sex lifestyle, and this is what they say. In any campaign to win over the public, gays must be cast as victims in need of protection, so straights will be inclined by reflex to assume the role of protector. If gays are presented instead as a strong and prideful tribe promoting a rigidly nonconformist and deviant lifestyle, they are more likely to be seen as a public menace that justifies resistance and oppression. For that reason, we must forego the temptation to strut our gay pride publicly when it conflicts with the gay victim image. And here's the name of the game here. Get the public to think you're a victim. Once you get that, then you can get this elevated status under the law called civil rights protection. Once you get that, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, and this is what Kim Davis is facing, that becomes a weapon by which you can punish legally objectors. This, and this is how they have planned to what they call overhaul straight America. It's a war against Christianity is what it is. Because we, as I'll show you in a minute, are really the only people in the culture that would have some sort of moral objection against this lifestyle. It's legal weaponry. And uh, here's an interesting cartoon uh, uh, someone sent me. This was given after the passing of Proposition 6, which was one of these state initiatives affording homosexuals civil rights coverage. And this person is working in government and they say, this person says, may we help you? And there you've got three men, uh, a boy and a fish. And they show up and they say, we're in a loving relationship. And we would like to get married. We'd like your approval. The person behind the desk says, yes, well, I'm afraid that our definition of marriage is limited to just a loving relationship. Two adults, two humans. And what do they say? What? How dare you force your definition of a loving relationship on us? And you see, this is what happens when you abandon the traditional criteria, not only for civil rights, but also for marriage. It allows virtually any lifestyle to demand that same type of legal protection. It really opens up Pandora's box. And so consequently, a new uh, word has been invented called a thruple. If you Google the word thruple, you'll see all sorts of interesting things come up about that. But these are three women in Massachusetts that are seeking uh, legal protection afforded typically to only heterosexual married couples. Well, that state a long time ago jettisoned the idea that marriage is between a man and a woman. So we're going to allow same-sex couples to get married. Well, the next step is a thruple. And if we're going to stop with heterosexuals, 
Only they can get married. And we're going to, uh, excuse me, not stop with them, open the door to same-sex couples. And there really isn't any logical argument for denying the same, cover, the same uh, legal protection to throuples. Just to show you where we are in this culture, um, this is an article by Margot Kaplan. She is a law professor. She's a fairly uh, well-published law professor, works at a fairly well-known uh, law school, and she wrote an uh, editorial, if you will, in the New York Times, and the title of it is Pedophilia, a Disorder, Not a Crime. And what she is doing in this article is she is saying people with pedophilia uh, are born that way. So they deserve the same legal protection that we give homosexuals. And when you read her article, you really can't argue with the logic. She's using the exact same logic that the same-sex movement has been using for many years. So the first myth that I would just want to draw your attention to is this myth that same-sex individuals and couples should be given the same elevated legal protection afforded to racial minorities. Let me take you to a second myth, and this is how it relates to you as a spiritual leader. Myth number two is as follows. Granting same-sex couples the right to marry will have no impact on religious freedom. That's a myth. The argument that's made is, well, go ahead and let same-sex individuals get married. Go ahead and give them civil rights protection. What does it really matter? Who is it going to hurt? Well, it obviously hurt somebody. Kim Davis spent some time in jail because of this. Here is uh, Chief Justice Roberts uh, in his dissenting opinion in the latest case, Obergefell versus Hodges. This is what he says. He's dissenting. If you are among the many Americans of whatever sexual orientation who, who favor expanding same-sex marriage, by all means, celebrate today's decision. Celebrate the achievement of a desired goal. Celebrate the opportunity for a new expression of commitment to a, a partner. Celebrate the availability of new benefits, but do not celebrate the Constitution. It had nothing to do with it. What you have to understand is the Supreme Court, back in June, looked at the Constitution the same way an amillennialist looks at the Bible. Um, they applied what we would call an allegorical interpretation. They invented something that simply was not there. I know it wasn't there because they say this supposed constitutional right comes out of the 14th Amendment. When you study the ratification of the 14th Amendment, I think all the way back in 1868, right in there, what you discover is every state in the Union that ratified that amendment had on their books state laws that said marriage is reserved for a man and a woman. So in no way, shape, or form is there anything found in the 14th Amendment that would justify same-sex marriage. But miraculously, some jurists caused this right to appear. And what I want you to understand about this is this is a zero-sum game. What I mean by a zero-sum game is when you invent a right, somebody wins and somebody loses. There's no nicer way of saying it. If you're going to create a right out of thin air, then that will automatically infringe upon, encroach upon another existing right. So this, uh, again, was brought up by uh, Chief Justice John Roberts in his uh, dissenting opinion. He says, today's, today's decision, for example, creates serious questions about religious liberty. Many good and decent people oppose same-sex marriage as a tenet of their faith, and their freedom to exercise religion is, unlike the right imagined by the majority, actually spelled out in the First Amendment. You look at the First Amendment, and it actually says something about the protection of religious freedom. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. But you see, when you get into this business of creating rights out of thin air, which is what just happened 
back in June, then that is automatically going to impinge upon, encroach upon another right, in this case, religious liberty. The fact of the matter is you all know your Bible very well. The scripture and many people in this culture still believe this way. The scripture either promotes heterosexuality or it condemns homosexuality from cover to cover. God's blueprint for heterosexuality is very firmly established in Genesis 1 and 2. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah condemns homosexuality. You find condemnations of homosexuality in the Mosaic Law. Jesus Christ comes along in the New Testament, particularly in Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, and reaffirms the heterosexual standard. And then the Apostle Paul gets into the act. Paul three times promotes heterosexuality. Paul, three times, two passages we've already read, condemns the lifestyle of homosexuality. He doesn't condemn homosexuals, but he condemns homosexuality. God, as we typically like to say, loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And there are many people in this country that think this way based on the scripture. But what do you do with those individuals, such as Kim Davis, when they find themselves on the wrong side of the power curve. Because a brand new right has been created, what we're told over and over again is those of us that have a biblical conviction must, to use an expression, find a seat on the back of the bus. Jack Phillips is a baker, this is a news article, who declined to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex couple because his Christian belief is that marriage exists only between a man and a woman. Now a Colorado judge has ordered him to bake cakes for same-sex marriages, and if Phillips refuses, he could go to jail. My goodness, what happened to this First Amendment that we just mentioned a little early, a little time ago? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What about Jack Phillips' freedom of religion? Here's another example. In yet another example of gay activist overreach, an Oregon official has not only burdened a Christian couple with a ridiculous fine, he's imposed a gag order on them. In one of the most egregious anti-Christian acts committed by a state official in recent memory, Oregon Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian not only upheld the ridiculous $135,000 fine levied against Aaron and Melissa Klein for declining to bake a cake for a lesbian commitment ceremony, but he ordered the clients to cease and desist from making any public comments about their religious convictions relative to the case. One right is invented, the existing rights that are specified start taking a hit. This is happening all over the country, even as I speak. Freedom of religion suffered a serious blow in the recent case Obergefell versus Hodges. Now this is what Justice Kennedy said in the majority opinion. He wrote the majority opinion five to four. He said, finally, it must be emphasized that religions and those who adhere to religious doctrines may continue to advocate with utmost and sincere conviction that by divine precepts, same-sex marriage should not be condoned. The First Amendment ensures that religious organizations and persons are given proper protection as they seek to teach the principles that are so fulfilling and so central to their lives and faith and to their own deep aspirations uh, and to their own deep aspirations to continue the family structure that they have long revered. The same is true of those who oppose same-sex marriage for other reasons. Now, I want you to notice the language that he chose here. When he finally got to page 27, which is at the very end of the decision, he finally threw a bone to religious liberty, and he says, you all that have beliefs about homosexuality from the Bible, go ahead and advocate and teach. Well, words have meaning, don't they? That's not what the First Amendment says. The First Amendment does not give us a right to advocate and teach. What the First Amendment says is the free exercise of religion. You say, well, what's the difference? This is just a semantic game. Let me show you the difference. Advocate and teach is what you say. 
freedom of religion and the exercise thereof is what you do. It's what you practice. It relates to your decision not to have Duluth Bible Church, for example, a home to a same-sex wedding. That's no longer advocate and teach. That's free exercise. Free exercise and what we do is guaranteed by the First Amendment. To just call it, you guys are allowed to advocate and teach, takes our freedoms and dramatically shrinks them. And all of the dissenting justices pointed this out in this five to four decision. Here's what Justice Roberts said in his dissent. The majority graciously suggests that religious believers may continue to advocate and teach their views of marriage. The First Amendment guarantees, however, the freedom to exercise religion. Ominously, that is not a word the majority uses. Hard questions arise when people of faith exercise religions in ways that may seem to conflict with the new right to same-sex marriage. For example, a religious college provides student housing only to opposite-sex married couples. Or a religious adoption agency declines to place children within same-sex uh, married couples. See, what he's saying is, advocate and teach just shrunk the rights. That relates to what you say. Justice Roberts says, I want to know what this decision is and how it's going to impact what people do. For example, a college. We're only going to have opposite sex married couples housing. That right disappears, you see. Once again, the First Amendment, what does it say? It doesn't say anything about advocate and teach. It says, or prohibiting, the government cannot prohibit the free exercise thereof. Words mean things. Words matter. Vocabulary matters. Now, this is uh, something from Wisconsin Senator Tammy Baldwin. She was interviewed the Saturday, the very next day, after the Supreme Court handed down this decision, Obergefell versus Hodges, and this is what happened. On Saturday, the day after the Supreme Court's uh, Rule, uh, ruling, related ruling, Wisconsin Senator Tammy Baldwin was asked, should the gay bakery have to bake the cake for the gay couple getting married? Where do you come down on that? Baldwin responded, the First Amendment says that in institutions of faith that there is absolute power to, you know, to observe deeply held religious beliefs. Well, look at this next line. But I don't think it extends far beyond that. What she is saying is get back in your church. Don't bring your Bible-based uh, views out in society where it might affect anybody else. You can teach and advocate whatever you want in the church. And she has, through this statement, shrunk in our influence to the four walls of the church. That's the difference between teach and advocate versus free exercise. And what I have noticed is public officials today are using the expression freedom of worship, and they no longer use the expression, in many cases, freedom of religion. Those are two totally different ideas. Here's what one author says. He says, let's be clear, however, language matters when it comes to defining freedoms and limits. A shift from freedom of religion to freedom of worship moves the dialogue from the world stage into the physical confines of a church, temple, synagogue, or mosque. Such limitations can unleash unbridled initiative that we have only experienced in a mild way through actions determined to remove roadside crosses, wearing of religious t-shirts and pro-life pins, as well as initiatives of evangelization. It could also uh, exclude our right to raise our children in our faith, the right to religious education, literature, or media, the right to ec uh, raise funds or organize charitable activities, the right to express religious beliefs in the normal discourse of life. Don't let people get away with using this expression, freedom of worship. When they say freedom of worship, it's like it, what they're saying is get back into your church, express your views there. That is not what the First Amendment says. What it says is freedom of religion. And there's a world of difference between those two ideas. These dissents, they're really quite interesting as you read through them. That these dissenting opinions just go on and on, criticizing the majority. Alito writes this, today's decision usurps 
the constitutional right of the people to decide to keep or alter the traditional understanding of marriage. The decision will have other important consequences. It will be used to vilify Americans who are willing, unwilling to assent to the new orthodoxy. In the course of its opinion, the majority compares traditional marriage laws to that denied equal treatment for African Americans and women. The implications of this analogy will be exploited by those who are determined to stamp out every vestige of dissent. I'm not quoting here from right-wing literature. This is in the actual dissenting of op opinion of the Supreme Court justices. Alito goes on and he says, perhaps recognizing how its reasoning may be used, the majority attempts towards the end of an opinion to reassure those who oppose same-sex marriage that their rights of conscience will be protected. We, we will soon see whether this proves to be true. I assume that those who cling to the old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes. But if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by governments, employers, and schools. Justice Thomas, in dissent, says this, in our society, marriage is not simply a governmental institution, it's a religious one as well. Today's decision might change the former, but it cannot change the latter. It appears but inevitable that the two will come into conflict. That's why this session is entitled The Coming Conflict between the government and the pulpit. It appears all but inevitable that the two will come into conflict, particularly as individuals and church churches are confronted with the demands to participate in and endorse civil marriages between same-sex couples. The majority appears unmoved by that inevitability. It only makes a weak gesture towards religious liberty in a single paragraph on page 27. And even then, that gesture indicates a misunderstanding of religious liberty in our nation's tradition. Thomas goes on and he says, religious liberty is about more than just protection for religious organizations and uh, persons as they seek to teach the principles that are so fulfilling and so central to their lives and faith. Religious liberty is about freedom of action. In matters of religion generally, and the scope of that liberty is directly correlated to the civil restraints placed upon religious practice. Although our Constitution provides some protection against such governmental restrictions on religious practices, the people have long elected to afford broad, broader protection than this court's constitutional precedents mandate. Oh, just go ahead and let same-sex couples marry. It's not going to hurt anybody. That's the line we're given. And I'm saying, and apparently, four Supreme Court justices concur with what I am saying, or maybe better said, I concur with what they are saying, that it does have an effect on freedom of religion. That's why we need to be concerned about this issue. We need to be aware of what's happening right before our very eyes. Let me take you to a third myth. And this is the myth that the progressive left in America sincerely cares about the rule of law. I mean, what you hear over and over again is Kim Davis needs to follow the rule of law. The Supreme Court has spoken. White House Press Secretary Josh Earnest, when asked about Mrs. Davis' situation, Earnest declared, no public official is above the rule of law. So suddenly the rule of law is important? I mean, is this the same crowd that defended Bill Clinton with all of his perjury and obstruction of justice for eight years? Now all of a sudden the rule of law matters. Isn't that interesting? Or what about Hillary's emails? Isn't she, didn't she set up that separate server in violation of federal law? What about the Planned Parenthood videos? where Planned Parenthood officials are lunching and drinking uh, expensive wine at expensive restaurants, talking about the harvesting of baby body parts. When they did that, they violated federal law. How come nobody's concerned about the rule of law in these situations? What about sanctuary cities, where illegal immigrants can flee to and avoid federal prosecution? Aren't those scenarios 
in contradiction to the rule of law and federal law, but all of a sudden the progressive left is suddenly worried about the rule of law. In fact, most of the Supreme Court cases that the left in America reveres, when you actually study those cases, all of them are gross violations of the rule of law. Take, for example, the Marbury versus Madison decision in 1803, which gave the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court gave to itself the power of judicial review, where it could declare ordinary acts of the legislature null and void based on its own interpretation of the Constitution. That whole decision ran roughshod over the rule of law. How do I know that? Because John Marshall, the Chief Justice who wrote that opinion, was involved in the facts of the case. He should have recused himself. He should have issued no ruling at all in that case because the decision that he was writing affected him when you study that out. What about the Engel versus Vital case, which threw Bible reading and prayer out of the schools in 1962 on the basis that there is a strict wall of separation of church and state in the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment? Read the First Amendment all you want. It doesn't say strict. It doesn't say wall. It doesn't say separation. It doesn't say church. And it doesn't say state. Other than that, I guess he's fairly close, right? <laughs> but that's a total trashing of the rule of law. He just rewrote the First Amendment, is what they did in Engel versus Vital. In fact, when courts make decisions, they're supposed to cite precedent. They're supposed to cite what prior courts have done. The Engel versus Vital court cited no precedent. They admitted this. Finally, in Engel versus Vital, only last year, these principles, that's the supposed strict wall of separation between church and state, were so universally recognized that the court, without the citation of a single case, reaffirmed them. That's what you call a make-it-up-as-you-go philosophy, a trashing of the rule of law. What about Roe versus Wade? The right of a woman to procure an abortion. Where did they find that one? Guess where? 14th Amendment again. Pulled it right out of the hat. And in the process, they took away from the states, which all had laws, with the exception of maybe a few, all had laws on their books, placing legal restrictions on abortion. What about Lawrence versus Texas? Another total trashing of the rule of law. This particular case overturned a 1986 case called uh, Bowers versus Hardwick in which there was an anti-sodomy statute in the state of Georgia. And the court in 1986 says, well, we don't agree with the law, but there's nothing in the Constitution that would violate that statute, so we're going to uphold the statute. Well, the Supreme Court in 2003 came along and they had no respect for settled law. They had no respect for the rule of law and with a stroke of a pen overturned Bowers versus Hardwick and found a constitutional right to sodomy. Where, where did they find that right? Where, guess where? The 14th Amendment. Pulled that rabbit right out of the hat again. And by the way, they also said the Georgia's law runs afoul of global opinion. I thought the purpose of our Supreme Court was to interpret our own constitution rather than be worried about whether we're in step with global opinion or not. And of course the Obergefell versus Hodges totally trashed the rule of law and it overturned probably over 30 states that had confined marriage to a man and a woman. And I, I just want you to, I'm not trying to drown you with a bunch of Supreme Court cases, I just want you to see the game that's being played here. Here's the name of the game. Let's get a progressive legal concept enshrined into law. And once we accomplish that, then we'll start demanding that everybody follow the rule of law. This chart you might find interesting. It's a number of separation of church and state cases. Now, you'll notice that it has on here the precedents that they all cited before 1947, 
and precedence after 1947. What's so significant about 1947? 1947 is when separation of church and state language first entered an official Supreme Court opinion. So they got that language in, and what do all of the subsequent courts do? They cite the 1947 case, as if American history started in 1947, see? So there's a, a game that, that is happening here, and as Christians, I think we need to be aware of it. People want to villainize this woman. The fact of the matter is, if she had done what she did in early June, there wouldn't have been a problem. But because she did it in later June, after the Supreme Court invented this right, now all of a sudden we have a legal issue and a legal problem. Kim Davis is not the villain in terms of the rule of law. Justice Kennedy is the villain. Justice Scalia, in his dissent, says this in Obergefell versus Hodges, today's decree says that my ruler and the ruler of 320 million Americans coast to coast is a majority of nine lawyers on the Supreme Court. This practice of constitutional revision by an unelected committee of nine, always accompanied by extravagant praise of liberty, robs the people of the most important liberty they asserted in the Declaration of Independence and won in the Revolution of 1776, the freedom to govern themselves. This is a naked judicial claim to legislative, indeed super legislative power, a claim fundamentally at odds with our system of government. A system of government that makes the people subordinate to a nine a, a committee of unelected lawyers. And that committee, he says, does not deserve to be called a democracy. Don't villainize Kim Davis. If you're looking for someone that has no respect for the rule of law, look at the majority in the United States Supreme Court. Let me take you to a fourth myth, myth number four. The fourth myth is that the Supreme Court of the United States has both the competence and the legal authority to act as the final arbiter of all constitutional matters. See, there's a narrative that's being pushed, and the narrative goes like this. The Supreme Court is the branch of government that decides what the Constitution means. Whatever they decide must impact every other branch of government, including the President and the Congress, and it must impact the state governments, and it must impact the city governments or local governments and county governments as well. The Supreme Court today is looked at almost like an omnipotent, omnicompetent body where we have to submit all of our constitutional questions to. And whatever they say, America must comply with. The fact of the matter is the Supreme Court doesn't even have, not forgetting the authority for a minute, they don't even have the competence to make those types of decisions. I'm not saying that our Supreme Court hasn't made good decisions. They have made many good decisions, but they've also made some terrible ones. In fact, you might be interested to know that our Supreme Court has reversed its own rulings in our history over 100 times, probably around 120 times. Supreme Court history is, is littered with bad decisions. Take, for example, the uh, Dred Scott decision, which says that slaves are not persons within the 14th Amendment. Now, the 14th Amendment, actually the 14th Amendment was passed a little later, but it said the, uh, the existence of the Constitution without the 14th Amendment, it says slaves are not persons, the infamous Dred Scott decision. What about uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, which, uh, came out in 1896. Plessy versus Ferguson was a decision upholding the constitutionality of state laws requiring racial segregation in public facilities under the doctrine of separate but equal. You say, well, wait a minute, Andy, didn't the Supreme Court overrule itself on that? Yeah, 60 years later, they finally overruled that. But separate but equal was law of the land in the United States of America because of the United States Supreme Court. 
Or how about the uh, Korematsu versus United States decision 1944, which ordered Japanese Americans into internment camps during World War II, regardless of American citizenship. The Supreme Court gave us that. How about a recent case, 2015, Zivotovsky v. Carey, where it ruled that Congress may not require the State Department to indicate in passports that Jerusalem is part of Israel. You can't even get that right? All you gotta do is open your Bible and read about that. Clearly, Jerusalem is the capital of the nation of Israel. In addition to uh, competence, the Supreme Court really doesn't have the authority to do a lot of the things that he is, it is doing. In fact, in the Federalist Papers, going back to our country's origin, Federalist number 78 indicates that the judicial branch of government is the least dangerous branch of government. I would submit that the least dangerous branch of government has become the most dangerous branch of government. In fact, John Jay, our country's first Chief Justice to the United States Supreme Court, appointed by President George Washington, Washington wanted to reappoint him as Chief Justice and John Jay turned down the offer. He said this court simply doesn't have enough power and it's a dead end job. So being a Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, you know, has no career mobility. <laughs> and so he actually turned down that commissioning. You see how far we've drifted away from the origins of our foundation and our country. David Barton brings up a very interesting point. He says, as in many documents, the Constitution lists the most important aspects first, progressing to those of lesser consequence. Following the preamble, Article I describes the Congress, Article II the presidency, Article III the judiciary. Not only does the order of listing reveal their relative position of importance, but the amount of detail provided by each branch also reflects its relative importance. The legislature, Article I, received 255 lines of print, while the presidency, Article II, only 114 lines. The judiciary, Article Three, merited a mere 44 lines. You see, not only is the judiciary mentioned last in terms of the three branches of government, but the least amount of print is devoted to the judiciary. The Founding fathers never envisioned that the judiciary would become this omnipotent, omnicompetent institution that it has unfortunately evolved into. In fact, this is interesting to think about. Did you know that the Supreme Court didn't even have its own building? until around 1935. They used to meet in the chambers, um, I believe, of the, the Senate. And yet, uh, what is happening today? People say the Supreme Court of the United States and its rulings is the final say because after all, Supreme Court opinions are the supreme law of the land. Is that what the Constitution says? Incidentally, nowhere in the Constitution is the court given supreme authority over the other two branches of government. The Constitution itself was declared to be supreme. Article 6, Clause 2. Not the will of the individuals holding the federal office tasked with enforcing it. Study the Constitution on your own. It never says the Supreme Court and its decisions are the supreme law of the land. What it says is the Constitution itself is the supreme law of the land, Article 6, Clause 2. This is why Abraham Lincoln defied the Dred Scott decision. In the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court declared that Congress could not prohibit slavery and that slaves were only property and not persons eligible to receive any rights of a citizen. Fortunately, the other branches of government ignored this ruling. In 1862, President Lincoln did issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which was a direct affront to the court's decision, because President Lincoln was guided by his own understanding of the Constitution. Rather than by the judiciary's opinion, he declared freedom for slaves in the Emancipation Proclamation. If you want to know how a court uh, is supposed to act, and even before we get to that, a couple of quotes from Thomas Jefferson. 
Thomas Jefferson says, you seem, to, you seem to consider judges the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions. A very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. Our judges are as honest as other men and not more so, and their power the more dangerous as they are in office for life and not responsible as the other functionaries are to elective control. The Constitution has erected no such single tribunal. The problem is, what, do you disagree, what, what happens when you disagree with Roe versus Wade, Ingle versus Vital, Carmazzo versus the United States, Obergefell versus Hodges, Lawrence versus Texas? What happens if you disagree? The answer is nothing. You have no recourse against the Supreme Court. The only people we actually vote for are our congressmen, senators, the president, local government. But once you're on the federal judiciary, you're in there for life. This is what Thomas Jefferson is warning against. He goes on and he says that each of the three departments has the equal right to decide for itself what is truly under the Constitution without any regard to what the others may have decided for themselves under a similar question. He's saying the Supreme Court is not the final arbiter of all constitutional decisions. Each branch of government has the, its own right to determine the meaning of the Constitution for itself. This is how courts used to act, going back to 1913, a Texas Supreme Court case dealing with marriage. This is what the judges said, 1913. Marriage was not originated by human law. When God created Eve, she was a wife to Adam. They then and there occupied the status of husband and wife and wife to husband. It would be sacrilegious to apply the designation a civil contract to such a marriage. It is, uh, it is that and more a status ordained by God. We're not gonna get into the subject of marriage, they said. We're certainly not going to rewrite it, because after all, that's outside of our jurisdiction. That's God's jurisdiction. That's what courts used to act like, but how things have changed. Now, a very famous quote amongst legal scholars and jurists on the Supreme Court is, with five votes, we can do anything. You only need five for a majority opinion, and you can, re you can overhaul an entire nation should you choose to do that. And wow, how that is happening. Arizona voted English as their official language, but federal judges overruled it in 1997. Arkansas passed term limits for politicians, but federal judges overruled that in 1995. California voted to stop state funded taxpayer service to illegal aliens, but federal judges overruled that, 1995. Colorado, citizens voted not to give special rights to homosexuals, but federal judges overruled that, 1992. Missouri, voters defeated tax increases, but federal judges overruled that, 1990. Missouri, citizens limited contributions to state candidates, but a federal judge overruled that. January of 2000, in Missouri, they passed a woman's right to know. Governor Bob Holden vetoed it. Legislators overruled his veto, but a federal judge overruled that in 2000. Nebraska, citizens passed a marriage amendment with 70% of the vote, but a federal judge overruled that. 2005. New York, citizens voted against physician-assisted suicide, but federal judges overruled that. 1996. Washington, citizens voted against physician-assisted suicide, but federal judges overruled that. 1996. Washington passed limits for, term limits for politicians, judges overruled that. 1995. Back to Missouri, legislatures passed a ban on partial birth abortion. Democrat Governor Mel Carnahan vetoed it in a historic session. 15,000 citizens knelt in prayer around the state capitol as the legislature overrode his veto. Days later, federal district judge Scott Wright suspended the law for five years, and it's currently in limbo. 
on and on we could go. And your average person looks at this and they're so frustrated with our system because nothing we do seems to have any impact. It's interesting that everybody's getting behind Donald Trump and everybody's getting behind Ben Carson. Why? Because everybody's frustrated. They don't want to get behind a career politician anymore. They want to get behind what they think is an outsider. But this idea that the Supreme Court has both the competence and the legal authority to act as they are currently acting is yet another myth. And one more myth. And with this, we will be finished. You might take your Bible and go over to Daniel. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's start with 1 Peter 2 and hold a place open to Acts 5 and then another place in Daniel 3. 1 Peter 2, Acts 5, and Daniel 3. See, as I'm giving this talk, this is not going to be the type of talk where I'm going to say, rah, rah, let's get out and vote, and let's turn it around. Um, I wish we could turn it around. But we've been trying to turn things around since the 1980s with the moral majority and other groups. Things aren't getting turned around. So this is the type of talk where I am trying to prepare us for what is inevitably coming. I'm not against voting and participating in the political process, but it seems to me that the die is cast. The wheels are turning against us. And there is this collision that is, that is happening between the government and Bible believers, and that collision is not going away. To think that the same-sex movement will change the military, and that's enough for them. They'll change the Boy Scouts of America, and that's enough for them. And we'll just leave the pulpit of the church alone. To think that way is the height of, of being naive. What they have done with changing the rules in the American Psychiatric Society an association, what they have done with the Boy Scouts of America, what they have done with the United States military, is inevitably coming against the church. And that's why I told you at the beginning, this was not the type of talk where I could get up and give you kind of the warm fuzzy for the day. This is reality, people. This is what is happening. And as shepherds and spiritual leaders, we need to start thinking very carefully about some of these issues. I, I took Dr. Toussaint uh, in my Dallas seminary training, and he was going through 1 Peter. And he stopped right in the middle of the lecture, and he, he told us as future spiritual leaders, because the point of 1 Peter is about suffering. He says, this culture is changing. Suffering is coming against the people of God in the United States of America, and you need to be stealing, S-T-E-E, L-I-N-G, in other words, strengthening, preparing, fortifying the minds of your people for the suffering that's coming. And he made that statement, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago. And I wrote it down when he said it because he just interrupted his lecture and said it. It was almost like the voice of a prophet. And we need to get back to 1 Peter because 1 Peter tells us how we're supposed to act as God's people as suffering comes our direction. So the fifth myth is this. Scripture commands unlimited submission to the government. Notice uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Most people quote this. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing the right thing you may silence the ignorance of foolish men, act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brethren, fear the king, honor the king. Most people look at that and say, case closed. Any ruling from the Supreme Court or any governmental entity, we are obligated as Christians to blindly follow it. I will remind you that the man who wrote those words also did something, did he not, in Acts 5, verses 27 through 29. 
when they had brought them, they stood before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to, to continue to teach anymore in his name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and, and listened to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter, the same guy that wrote those beautiful verses we read earlier, answered, We must be, obey God rather than man. The fact of the matter is there is a case for civil disobedience in the scripture. The paradigm, I believe, for us as shepherds is rapidly becoming the book of Daniel. You all know the story of the book of Daniel, how Daniel and his three friends and Judah were exported or deported 350 miles to the east in a place called Babylon. They were outside the land of Israel for 70 years. They were under the authority of the Babylonian, later the Persian system, that was constantly passing laws which violated their religious beliefs. And so they had to think very carefully about civil disobedience. The book of Daniel, as you might know, is chiastically structured. Daniel's, Daniel 2 through 7 is all in Aramaic. The rest of the book and most of the rest of the Old Testament is in Hebrew. A chiasm simply means that the outer edges line up with each other. As you move inward, the inner parts line up with each other and so forth. So chapter 2 lines up with chapter 7. Chapter 3 lines up with chapter 6. Chapter 4 lines up with chapter 5. When you study 3 and 6, which form parallel arrangements in the chiasm, what you'll discover is the main subject matter is civil disobedience. In Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar built this giant statue and he told Daniel and his three friends, actually Daniel was out of the city at the time, but he told his three friends to bow down to it. Now, how can you do that as a Jew, a devout Jew, when the first commandment is no gods before me and the Next commandment is no graven images. You bow down to that statue, you're violating the first two commandments in the Decalogue. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said no to the king. Now that thematically lines up with Daniel 6, where the Persians behind Daniel's back passed a law which said no public prayers. Daniel, knowing full well of that Persian law, went ahead and prayed publicly three times anyway. See, we're having to think more and more about this issue of civil disobedience. Shouldn't shock us as Americans because we have a holiday named after the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. who articulated a philosophy of civil disobedience in the letter from the Birmingham Jail, also known as Letter from the Birmingham City Jail, it is an open letter written in April 16th, 1963 by Martin Luther King Jr. The letter defends the strategy of nonviolent resistance to racism. It says the people have a moral responsibility to break unjust laws and to take direct action rather than waiting potentially forever for justice to come through the courts. Responding to being referred to as an outsider, he wrote that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The letter was widely published and became an important text for the American Civil Rights Movement of the early 1960s. We're not the first Americans to think about civil disobedience. But now, given the current climate that we're in, we're having to think about this subject. So the book of Daniel is largely becoming a paradigm for us. Let me articulate very quickly, and I'm about finished, the principles of civil disobedience that I see from the book of Daniel, Acts 5, and elsewhere. Number one, civil disobedience becomes an option when there is a clear conflict between the laws of God and the laws of man. The two have to come into sharp collision. I would argue that they came into collision with Kim Davis. Number two, there must be an exhaustion of all legal remedies. In other words, we try to cooperate with the state the best we can, 
But finally, it gets to a point where cooperation would involve a violation of our conscience and biblical beliefs. And after those remedies have been exhausted, civil disobedience biblically becomes a possibility. In other words, civil disobedience is a last resort, not a first resort. And then number three, and this is why I had you turn to Daniel, Daniel 3, 16 and 17. As we engage in civil disobedience, we must continue to maintain respect for governmental authorities. Because we know from the Noahic Covenant, Genesis 9, we know from Romans 13 that God has authored the state to prevent what the Old Testament calls Genesis 6, 11, Hamas, which means violence. In other words, if you don't want to do the time, don't do the, what, crime, and that holds back man's sinful impulses, and consequently order can be maintained. So respect, prayer, paying our taxes, these are all things that we as Christians naturally want to do because we respect and understand the Bible and respect and understand where government ultimately comes from. So when civil disobedience becomes an option, we have to continue to maintain respect for government. For example, in Daniel 3, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, see how they're respectfully referring to him? We do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. And then later on in Daniel 3, verse 17 and following, it says this, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of fire. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. See how they keep respectfully referring to him as the king, even as they are disobeying the king's edict. And then the fourth uh, principle of civil disobedience is if we should find ourselves in a position where we must disobey the state, we have to be willing to pay the price or the consequences. Daniel 3 and verse 17 again says, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the blazing fire. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, did you see that? But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. God can deliver us, but he may not decide to. And as we approach the subject of civil disobedience and make a move in that direction, we have to be willing to pay the price, which could involve fines, imprisonment, and so forth. So I deliver this session to you this morning with a very heavy heart. I mean, this, this type of thing um, has been burdening me for a long time. The Kim Davis situation just kind of brought the whole thing to the forefront of my thinking, and I've tried to organize my thoughts the best I could using these five myths. Myth number one, same-sex individuals and couples should be given the same elevated legal protections afforded to racial minorities. Number two, extending legal protections to same-sex individuals and couples will not negatively impact religious freedom. Number three, the progressive left in America really cares about the rule of law. Number four, the Supreme Court has both the competence and the authority to act as the final arbiter of all constitutional questions. And then finally, the fifth myth is that scripture commands unlimited submission to the state.